you can hear me, please let me know in the chat box. Someone is typing, so I'm assuming they can hear me. Somebody can hear you. I can hear you. Excellent. Yes, yeah, I can hear that. And Paula is with us. Okay, good evening. We've got a few minutes until six o'clock, but um, I think we can crack on in the interest of time because I think we're going to need all the time we can get on this one. So everybody hopefully can see the, the home page, the cover. And just like Clem, from me, Dubai, all kinds of places. Yeah, so like Claire, it's from me. Um, a warm welcome from sunny Dubai. Uh, it's kind of sunset time for me here. And I'm sure for most people joining us, it will be towards the end of the day. However, for our guest, it definitely isn't. Uh, good evening, Dorothy. Good morning. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I know that this is pre-breakfast for you. So uh, we're really pleased to have you with us. Uh, okay, good. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dorothy, and then I think we'll get going straight away with the event. People will start coming in slowly, slowly, but that's fine. Okay, so this evening we have uh, with us Dorothy Zemak. Welcome, Dorothy. Dorothy Hello. taught in French and Japanese for uh, over 18 years in Asia, Africa, and the US. So she's been to a lot of places. She holds an MA in uh, TESOL from the School of International Training in Vermont, the USA. She's an author of over 20 textbooks. She now concentrates on writing and editing English language teaching materials and conducting teacher training workshops. In 2012, she founded a micropress that publishes fiction, non-fiction, and educational materials. Her areas of speciality and interest are teaching writing, teaching reading, business English, academic English, testing, and humor, which we'll be looking forward to a little bit of. She is a frequent plenary speaker at international conferences and a blogger for teacher talk at Azar Grammar. So there's lots of ways that our audience can connect with you and you are an incredibly busy person, it sounds like. So we are uh, overjoyed, I would say, at having you here with us this evening or this morning as it is for you. So uh, welcome, Dorothy. We're really pleased to have you with us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nathan Waller. I'm the teacher trainer for Macmillan Education here in the MENA region. I'm sure lots of you have touched base with me in the past. Um, okay, about the session. So uh, if you're just joining us now, certificates for this session are automatic. So in the next couple of days, you will receive an automatic email uh, with your certificate, with your name on it. You don't need to do anything. It's already done by the system based on your registration and attendance. So don't worry about the uh, certificate, although I will put something in the chat box to remind anybody who comes in now. Uh, as well as that, we will also be connecting with you and I will explain a little bit about that at the end. So we're gonna do approximately an hour for uh, Dorothy's presentation and then I know she's happy to take some questions at the end. Um, so if you have any questions for Dorothy, please pop them in the chat box. I will be in the background. I will turn my mic and camera off, but I'll still be a presenter. Uh, and I will keep an eye on the questions in the chat box so that I can ask you at the end, Dorothy, if that's okay. Once we finish the, uh, the presentation and the questions and answers, we'll take a short five minute break. Let everybody uh, grab a cup of tea or coffee, whichever is your preference. And then we will have uh, one hour for a panel discussion. We have uh, four guests that will be joining us um, and we will be contextualizing um, a lot of the things that I'm sure will come up in the presentation. Uh, student motivation here in MENA, um, the importance of 21st century skills. Um, so if you have any comments or if you have any questions for the panel, again, put them in the chat box and I will keep track of all of them. So from me, I will uh, leave Dorothy to the wonderful presentation. Dorothy, I'm really excited to hear what it is you have to say about academic English. And I will pass the platform to you. Good luck. Okay. 
which is wonderful. Great. Let me know. I'm in the background. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I will. I have. I have to say good morning to everyone because for me it's seven in the morning. I know for for a lot of you it's it's the afternoon or the evening. That's that's the beauty of, of these these online platforms is we can connect no matter where we are. So I am going to be talking about academic English and making the connection. That's my slide there. So as as Nathan mentioned, I am a, a an author with Macmillan. I was also the series consultant for the series Skillful. So when I was invited to, to do this presentation, I was thinking, what can I show you or tell you that only I know about these materials? And so I'm going to be giving you an author and a planner's perspective and, and show you the background of, of how we choose academic materials, how we write them, how we create them, where the language comes from, all of those things that really only, only an author knows. So as, a, as teachers, I think you know that what I, well, what I think is one of the main challenges of academic English is how do we get students from very personal approach that we get with general English, where we're asking, you know, where do you live? How many brothers and sisters do you have? What are you doing this weekend? To something more, more global, more universal, right? Nobody is learning English to talk to the people they already know, right? You don't need English to talk to your friends and coworkers in Saudi Arabia. You can use Arabic for that. You need English to talk to people in other countries. So not only does the language change and the functions and the communicative style and, and, and all of that change, but we also bring in, as, as, as Nathan sort of gave you a, a preview of what's coming on the panel discussion, all of those 21st century skills and, and skills that students need to, to you know, connect with the world, to go from the personal language that they've been studying before to a more global language. So I want to talk to you about how exactly we do that with the materials that we create for teachers. So how do we, how do we write a course book? I know when you look at a book, you look at page one and then two and then three and then four. That's certainly not how it gets written. First, we have to start with some kind of global view. And I think there are two basic ways that we can do that. One is you can map out all of the grammar and language and vocabulary and skills and plan that out from the lowest level to the highest level, and then write material or find text that will fit that approach. Or you can begin with texts at different levels, reading texts or listening texts, and pull out the grammar and the vocabulary and the skills that students will need in order to cope with that material. Neither way is better than the other way, and I've written actually books in both styles. And I'm gonna give you today examples from both of those different approaches, mainly with, with skillful, because we're gonna take a really in-depth look at one unit, but I also have some examples from Open Mind. But no matter which approach you use, after you, you write a unit and choose a text, there's always some adjusting, right? We make the language a little higher level or a little lower level. We add some vocabulary, we review some vocabulary from a previous unit, something like that. So I'm gonna dig into um, Macmillan's Dual Skills series, Skillful. What, um, what not many people remember anymore is that Skillful was actually not the original name. The original name of the series, while we were writing it, it was never published this way, was Elements. That was a name that I chose and I loved. And I thought it's because what we're teaching are, are, are different pieces of language and communication, but they all fit together and we have themes fitting together and language fitting together. So as we were working on the book, we imagined that it would be called elements and actually if you look if you look at the covers you can still see puzzle pieces on them but we got the news from the japan office 
that we could not use the title elements. They said it was unsuitable. And when we asked why, they said, ah, because it has the letter L in it, right? Elements. And the letter L is difficult for Japanese people to pronounce. So they said, whatever title you have, it cannot have the letter L in it. So for a while, the book had no title at all. We were just working on writing. And eventually we wound up with skillful. I can't explain that. And I was a little irritated at first to have lost my beloved elements. But the more I thought about the title skillful, the more I came to see that it was actually a better title. Because skillful, of course, has, has two meanings. It can mean being good at something, right? Being able to do something very well. And it also means that it is full of skills. And I think skillful is both. But that was a title that, that encapsulated the approach we, we wound up taking. So to write the book, which is, you know, five levels, there's a reading, writing strand, there's a listening, speaking strand, and the topics fit together like that. We assembled a team of authors. Oh, we came from everywhere, uh, some in the UK, a lot in the US, one in Australia, you know, English teachers, they live all over the globe. We met for a week in Boston, uh, which was chosen just because geographically it was between us all. And we sat down with a lot of coffee and tea and, and mapped out topics and authors fought for which topics they wanted. Once we had the topics, then we thought, what skills are there going to be? And we, and we kind of planned out the whole series just by, by topic and, and the angle we were going to take. Then the authors for each level went back to their respective homes and started writing. So on the second edition for the third level, that green level down there, we lost an author because she retired. She's now happily traveling the world. Well, she's not traveling this year, but normally she's happily traveling around the country with her husband. This year, I'm sure she, she's home wearing a mask. But I, I stepped in to replace her. And so I joined the second edition as a writer. And so that's why I'm able to show you really the, the nuts and bolts of how I wrote a unit. So I'm gonna choose one unit and we're going, I'm gonna show you where I started from, how I chose the language and how I built that out. But first, I'm gonna give you a little background on me. So I grew up in the state of New Mexico. So on the map there, it's the, the orange one in the lower right hand corner. Uh, it's a southwestern state in the United States. And specifically, I come from the town of Los Alamos, New Mexico, small little town up in the mountains in New Mexico. And I wonder if anybody knows why this small town, about 17,000 people, is famous. Do you know what Los Alamos is famous for? If you know, you can pop it into the chat. But if you don't know, I will tell you, of course. Ah, somebody knows. Los Alamos is the home of, uh, well, as they say, the birthplace of the atomic bomb. It is where the first nuclear bombs were designed. They were not tested in town. They were tested in the desert in the south of the state. But today, really, the only industry in, in Los Alamos is a large laboratory. It is not all weapons. There's a lot of uh, energy research, there's solar energy and geothermal energy. But there is still nuclear research. There is still weapons research. My father did not do weapons. We always, people from Los Alamos divide each other into the weapons people and the not weapons people. We were, we were not weapons people. Just outside Los Alamos, a oh, five, 10 minute drive, is this beautiful national park called Bandelier National Monument. I can see I was home for Christmas sometimes. This is me, my husband, and my son. You can see, I, I know it's Christmas because I can see snow on the ground. So you can see, even though it's winter and there has been snow recently, you can see that the area is very, very dry. Because we're up in the mountains, 
We also get a lot of um, summer storms with lightning. Very short rain, sometimes hail, but a lot of lightning storms. So hundreds of years ago before there were people, the lightning would hit these very dry trees and there would be small forest fires that would burn. When people moved into the area, they didn't want the land to burn, of course, because they had houses and communities and they're raising cattle and livestock. So when fires start, they would immediately put them out or try to prevent fires from starting in the first place. But if you don't have small regular fires, all of this dead wood builds up in the land. And then if a fire comes that you can't stop, it's much larger and much hotter. So to protect people from a huge uncontrollable fire, what the Forest Service does is something called a controlled burn, where they take a section of, of land and they set a fire on purpose, let it burn, put it out, then move to another section, set that on fire, let it burn, put it out. And that was planned for this area in Bandelier. So here is a map of what should have happened. And you can see there's a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three. They were supposed to start a fire down Frijoles Canyon is, is where you saw that photo. And at the very top, up on the peak of the Cerro Grande Mountains, that was going to burn. Then they were going to put those out, burn the two sides, and finally burn the middle. That was the plan. But they started the fire on a windy day and they lost control. And Bandelier is so close to the town of Los Alamos that the fire started coming into town. Those buildings that you see in the, the lower part of the picture, those are lab buildings. When a large uncontrollable fire roars towards a nuclear laboratory that may or may not have weapons, people get very nervous. So the lab property was threatened. The town burned, not every house. I think we lost three or 400 houses. Everybody evacuated. My parents' house didn't burn, but of course filled with, with smoke for days. It was pretty destructive. And, you know, a lot of people, I don't know, people were killed, but a lot of people lost everything. Eventually, of course, the fire was put out by firefighters. And people were able to return to the town. But a very dramatic incident. So when I was given this level of skillful to write. And I was told that the topic of unit four was fire. All of these feelings came up in me about fire. And of course, immediately my mind went to the Cerro Grande fire. So that's what I started with in the unit. A unit has two readings, a reading one, a reading two. Unit, the second reading is a little bit longer, a little bit more difficult. So I didn't start with page for the first page, you know, and the pre-reading exercises of the first reading in the whole unit, I started actually in the middle with the most difficult reading, controlling the uncontrollable about that practice of controlled burns. Once I had written sort of a rough draft of my reading, then I, I stepped back to look at it so I could begin to pick out vocabulary, grammar, the language points. And I know that where students are moving to is a, an end of the unit writing. So they are going to have to be able to write on a topic that is probably unfamiliar when they begin the unit. And woven throughout all of that, we need critical thinking, study skills, 21st century skills, etc. So all of those broad areas have specific tasks that they also have to to fulfill for example every every reading we have a global skill and a, and a close skill like a you know a micro skill and a macro skill 
um, the grammar that comes out of the reading has to also be something that students would naturally use when they discuss the topic and when they write about the topic. Um, and I, what was very important for me back at the, the, the planning stage of that was, was the idea of critical thinking, because I kind of a, a pet peeve of mine of, with textbooks when they label every discussion question critical thinking. And I look at the questions and it says, you know, would you rather live in a small town or a big city? And I think, but that's not, that's not really critical thinking. And early on, I asked Macmillan, do you want actual critical thinking questions or do you want discussion questions? You know, both, both are fine, but if you call something critical thinking, it has to be critical thinking. And they said, no, we want critical thinking to be critical thinking. Here's an example of the questions that students will be able to discuss and cope with after they have finished that, that second reading. So they're not, as you can see, they're not personal questions. It's not, do you like fire or are you afraid of fire? It's, um, you know, what, what should the consequences be for a forest service personnel who set a fire trying to do good, but accidentally did something pretty bad? Um, what factors do we take into account for forest management? And finally, the question of responsibility and cost. This is a, a picture I, I took um, in the Medina in Tunis. I, I, when I was walking with my friend, I saw this and I stopped and I said, oh, I must get this photo. And she said, really? The mosque is under construction. And I said, yes, but it's, it's not a picture of a mosque for me. For me, it's a picture of scaffolding, most beautiful example of scaffolding. So I took that picture because it reminded me of how, how I write materials. So if I'm starting from that reading about controlled burns, and I know that this is going out to students all over the world, MOOC, of course, none of whom live in Los Alamos, who don't have the same background I do, what additional support do I need to provide students so that they can engage with this topic and understand it and, you know, and don't feel intimidated? And then that's how I choose my reading number one. My first reading is going to not only introduce them to the topic, some more basic vocabulary that they need, but it's, it's going to guide them towards that, that reading number two. So reading number one, I, cook, I, 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 did, I wrote a text on the top five causes of wildfires. And as a way to lead students into the topic, this is, this is the only exercise I'm, I'm gonna make attendees do, but I asked them to predict what are the top five causes of wildfires from one to five. You have five choices. Backyard burning means people setting fires in their own backyard could be you know, to just, just because it's attractive or they're trying to get rid of things in their own yard, cigarettes that are dropped, sparks from equipment, campfires that are not completely put out, or the category of what, what our Forest Service calls unsupervised activities like fireworks. So take, take a guess, put it in the chat. What do you think is the number one cause of wildfires and, and maybe what's number five? And we'll see if you can uh, if you can correctly guess. I, I will show you the answers, of course. But the reason I ask students to guess is because this kind of very simple prediction activity makes them interested in reading because now they're going to check their guesses. If I just hand them a reading and say, "Read about the causes of wildfires," I a lot of them will say, I don't care. But as soon as you make a prediction, you have a reason to read, to see if your predictions were correct. And here come the answers. It was not cigarettes. Cigarettes is actually number three. Unattended campfires, number one. And I think in the last year or two, maybe even sparks from equipment is, has, has moved up to number three. And you know, sometimes it, it depends on, on the year. So with this kind of prediction exercise, it doesn't matter if students guess correctly or not. They have some discussion, they do some thinking. 
I also am giving them that vocabulary. I want them to know the word equipment, which I'm going to work with. I want them to know sparks. Um, we think about burning. So that activity leads them into reading one, which is going to eventually read the, lead them into reading two. This is a, a look of a, a, a rough draft of, of reading two. After I write my text, then I go back and I look at my vocabulary. Those yellow words are academic wordless words. And every reading has a certain number of academic wordless words because we want students, of course, to have vocabulary for, for this unit, but also for you know, the rest of their academic life. I also start putting words in gray that I might keep, I might change. I'm, I'm going through looking for words that will be challenging at this level. And then I think, do they need them for this topic? Do I need them for this unit? Is it a useful word? Can they use it when they write? And I think that word undertaking, I think I, I removed that one because I thought, yeah, it's hard, but it's not so useful. But machinery, of course, I, I kept because that's one of the top five causes of wildfires. But that vocabulary word got previewed in reading one. So this is what happens then to that vocabulary. I do some pre-teaching of words that they need for that reading so that they can understand the reading without stopping and using the dictionary too much. And you can see under, there, there's a number one with definitions and number two is a is a more you know, exercise, a kind of exercise where they're putting the word into sentences. But then after the reading, we do some, some work with those academic word list words. And in this particular unit, because we had a lot of um, discussion of problems and the writing skill is a problem, our writing text is a problem solution text, I, I wanted to give them some work with the word problem and all the collocations that go with the problem, to cope with the problem, to be faced with problems. And the exercise is longer than, than what you see here. But all of this language came out of a very natural sounding text that was written first. I then go back to the reading. At this point, I probably have my reading one and reading two done. And I look for what grammar point is coming up the most. And what I noticed was a lot of gerunds and reduced clauses. Once I've decided on the grammar point, I might go and adjust the reading and put even more in, not so many that it's unnatural, but enough that I know they're going to be getting many chances to see the structure used naturally. I choose my, my reading skills, the global and the close reading skills, and I make sure that those are going to apply to both readings. Then I look to the writing task. What do students have to do at the end? And they're going to be writing a problem solution text. And then we also have, which is something that made me very happy at the planning stage, that we, we were able to put in a writing model. So students see the kind of composition they have to write as an example before they write their own. The question, that the model is responding to is slightly different. So students don't have the feeling of, oh, the writing model took all my good ideas. But they have a clear model to follow. And then they have a parallel, but slightly different question that they can apply those things to. So then they look at the writing model. They look at organization and support. And our, our writing skill was on how to support arguments. So you can have an argument, where's your proof? But all of those skills also show up in the reading. So students can go back to the reading text and look at means of support. They'll see it in the writing model as well. So they know what they have to do before they write on their own. When everything is mapped out in the unit, then I go back and I make what we call salting the exercise. So I'd like you season the meal. So I've Anywhere I can get that target vocabulary salted into the rest of the unit so that students have many opportunities to see it, to hear it, to look at it, and, and to figure out you know, how, that, how the vocabulary and how the grammar uh, works in, in natural English. 
Then, <laughs> once I've got all of that planned out, I choose a study skill that will fit with the work they're doing. I, I probably at this point mapped out my exercises. I've written one or two example sentences, but I haven't finished the exercises in case I change my mind. So at this point, I would finish writing the exercises. I'll add some pre-reading exercises. We do, of course, a review page of language, which I can't do until everything else is finished. Uh, a video is chosen to, to introduce the topic. That needs exercises. And the very last thing I did was always the first page of the unit, which is an infographic. I think it's very important that students have that graphic literacy these days, because that's, that's very common. But I can't choose a graphic until my unit is finished. It's like you can't choose a title for your composition or an introduction for your research paper until it's finished, because you have to, to know globally what your whole unit is about. So I, I chose a graphic on who owns the forests in the United States. And I, I don't know how easy it is for you to read the, the small print there, but if you know that 35%, the largest section of US forests are privately owned, and only 34%, right, is owned by the federal government and then some by state governments or Native American tribes, that makes forest management a more complex question. Can the federal government tell a private owner that he must burn his forests because he thinks that the government thinks that's safer? So they look at this infographic and then they have discussion questions and and you know some some little sentence stems so that they can begin to think about this global topic that's going to lead them into the reading one and the reading two. At that point, I was working on the reading writing book, or, or not just at that point, but throughout the writing of the unit, I talked with the author who's writing the parallel unit in the listening and speaking book to see what she's doing. She's got the same topic, she has fire, but of course we need to take a different angle because in some institutions, uh, a student might be having a listening speaking class and a reading writing class. So we want the grammar to fit together and the vocabulary to fit together and the topic to fit together, but not repeat. So I asked her what she did for her main listening. Well, I knew what she was doing for her main listening. And I also asked her to, to write something for, for this presentation about how she chose that topic. I'm not going to read it to you. It's, it's maybe three or four slides. I'm going to let you read it to yourself. This is what Ellen Kisslinger said about the main listening in her unit, which is forest fires, friend or foe. So I'll give you a few minutes to, to read. But right from the beginning, you can see her thinking is not a personal reaction to, to forest fires. She wants them to take a more academic reaction.
think that is a, a key academic skill is to be able to separate your own preconceptions and guesses and opinions from the evidence and the facts that are presented to you so that when you do engage with the topic with an opinion it's now supported by information and facts and, and evidence and support which as you will remember is the same skills they're using for the writing task in the reading writing book this is the before listening exercise and then the critical thinking discussion for her listening on forest fires friend or foe so they start with an introduction to the concept right what's what's the difference between a friend and a foe and they begin to predict right what's good about a fire what's bad about a fire how could it be both a friend and a foe but then after the listening then they apply that information and then also extend it what are possible long-term benefits of other natural disasters we're not used to thinking of of an earthquake or, or a tsunami or something as as good because they're often harmful to people but how do they how do they sometimes benefit the environment right modern agriculture owes so much to the annual flooding of the nile we don't think of a flood as something good but it can be for for growing plants once i've done my unit I have a co-author, so he's doing the odd number units, I'm doing the even number units. I also need to make sure that his unit connects to mine and my unit connects to his and that we're recycling skills that they learned in previous units and previewing things that are going to come up in, in next units. Then I send all my work off to an editor. I had very good editors. Um, there's a number of drafts and re rewriting and changing this and making it all fit. And then finally, I hope that I've written something interesting, relevant and useful. So if I think about that topic of fire though, so I don't live in New Mexico now, I live in Oregon now, and it's not oh, the sun's coming up. I can see it's gonna be a sunny day. Normally in the summer, this is a view from just outside town. This is that same view in the fall. That's not air pollution. I mean, that's not industrial pollution. We don't have any factories. That was the summer we had smoke from California. That smoke you are seeing is, one, is thousands of miles away. That's how bad the fires in California were. And actually, last fall, we had terrible forest fires in Oregon. And there were, I think, seven active fires around my town. I couldn't leave the house for two weeks um, because of, of fires and the, the smoke being so bad. When Oregon burns, the world loses timber. You lose grass. We are a major producer of grass seed and grass seed feeds animals that perhaps you eat. Uh, also other products like cranberries and filberts, but air pollution goes around the world. Fires go around the world. You might remember there were terrible fires in Greece a year or two ago. There were fires in Brazil where they lost a national library. So I want students to, to engage with the world because that's why they're learning English right, is to engage with people outside of their own communities. So although students themselves might not have any personal relationship with fire, they do have a relationship with the world. And that's where these topics and these skills are trying to lead them. So this is this is my little reminder that I'm going to show you a short YouTube clip. This is just a, a, a clip of, of New Mexico local news. And I've shown this to students. It's not, it's not a perfect clip. I mean, it's, it's not a language learning clip, the kind of thing you would take in and use to work on grammar. It's, it's very topic based. This is 10 years after the Cerro Grande fire. But after they've done the work of this unit, I show this clip. And although I know some of the language is going by them, 
their students are just transfixed because they have enough information about the topic, they have enough of those keywords that they're able to follow a rapid native speaker news cliff on a topic that, you know, a month ago would have been unfamiliar. So let me go to my, find my YouTube here, and we will watch this. Ten years ago today, what was supposed to be a controlled we have the volume here? mountains got wildly out of control and became the disastrous. Sorry, I'm going to start that again because we didn't we didn't have volume. Ten years ago today, what was supposed to be a controlled burn in the Hamas Mountains got wildly out of control and became the disastrous Seattle Grande fire. Hundreds of homes were destroyed in Los Alamos as people who lived there fled from the fast-moving flames. Pilot reporter Bob Martin brought us constant live coverage from Sky Ranger. Tonight, Bob revisits Cerro Grande. days after it jumped the lines and was declared a wildfire, the Cerro Grande was nipping at lab property but still far from the city. Crews in the air and on the ground were doing what they could. For crews in the air, high winds and rough terrain were making a tough job almost impossible. The problem is the tremendous updrafts and downdrafts coming off the back of this fire on, on this last run that I'd made. I was getting three, 4,000 feet a minute down and uh, we can't put an air tanker in there because he can't recover from that. On May the 10th, Los Alamos was evacuated. Only fire crews and a few bold residents who refused to leave were on hand as the flames rolled into town. Fire crews from all across the state came in to help. Some Los Alamos firefighters, nicknamed the Suicide Squad, made their stand right where the fire first invaded town. More than 300 homes would be lost, but the rest of the city was saved. Today, the mountains here above the town of Los Alamos still bear the deep scars of the Cerro Grande. It will take decades for trees to return. Retired Los Alamos National Lab fire ecologist Terry Fox, author of several Cerro Grande books, says the fire was made worse by too much suppression of natural fires. Much of the area that behind Los Alamos had burned for almost 100 years. Lots of new houses have popped up, but so have new fire codes. It's hoped new structures will withstand future fires better. Bob Martin, KRQ News 13, Los Alamos. And today, trees are, are regrowing in Los Alamos. There are still a lot of the forests in the area that look like this. You can still see you know, decades later, the burned trunks of, of trees that we lost in the Cerro Grande, but at the same time, new trees growing. So I like to end that unit with something a little hopeful for students so they don't just think, you know, that, it, that it's all bad because of course it's the listening speaking book that's talking about the benefits of, of wildfires. So I want to to, to finish with some, some smaller examples of where I get ideas from and also look at some lower level materials because I, I, I know teachers sometimes think, oh, but what can you do academically with, with students at a, an A2 or a B1 level? So when I'm looking for ideas, I get them from, from everything. Of course, sometimes there's a personal connection like something happened to my town. I look to current events. I absolutely think about my own teaching experience and students I've had recently. I do research, not, not just research like Googling something, but I, I live near a university. So often when I, I feel stuck for an idea, I walk down to the university and I, I listen to students and I watch what people are doing. And of course I use people I know. So this is an example from uh, Open Mind, the very lowest level. I, that, that's the level I wrote, so that's the level I know about. And it, it starts at A1 level, you know, but it's, it's, it's leading students further on down. But, you know, and that first unit where we have nouns and the verb to be, and we have numbers and letters, and I need to write authentic texts that use nouns, numbers, and letters. And that was a, a time that I felt stuck. So I walked down to the university and I'm just looking around and I saw a notice board. When students move out after the end of a term, 
they sell their things to the next students who are coming. They sell books and magazines and furniture and bicycles. And so my, my reading text was notes on a notice board. And of course, I, cause what I saw on these notes was names and phone numbers and addresses and prices, oh, letters and numbers. So although it's very low level material, it is still authentic or authentic like, and it's absolutely what students would encounter in a real university situation. Coming back from that, I walked by a, a yard sale. I don't know how popular those are in your countries, but certainly in, in North America and, and Europe, there are yard sales and garage sales where people, uh, flea markets where people are looking at, at objects and discussing what they are and buying them. And I heard people using there is and there are, and my little language writer brain was taking notes of, oh, here's some authentic language where people would use there is and there are to identify an object. Because even at that very low level, I want the text to seem realistic. A huge challenge for me always with low level text is the simple present tense because it's just not that common <laughs> for, for many situations. We use the simple past a lot. I talk about what I did. I, I tell people what I'm going to do. When do I use the simple present? I had an, uh, an email come to my inbox for my high school reunion. I clicked on a link and everybody was writing paragraphs in the simple present about what their life is like now right how they've changed in the 10 years since high school so i wrote sample text based on that situation and finally for the the uh, the final page of that unit that has present tense jobs I, I i love this title now it made me laugh so much today i mean working from home what kinds of jobs can you do at home oh goodness this year all of them <laughs> we're all working at home but in a normal year, <laughs> here are some kinds of jobs that people do at home. We have somebody who has her own business, a virtual receptionist. And finally, the, the, the last man there, Will Mitchell, I don't have a job, but I work every day. I'm a stay at home dad. That's my husband. Not, that's not his photo, but it is his name and it is his job. I was the wage earner. He's the one who, who did the domestic work and, and helped raise the child. So that's an example that came from my life. This uh, a higher, a higher level text, um, my grammar was, was relative pronouns with ever, whatever, however, whenever. And that's also a, a less common structure. But I was teaching an online writing course through, through edX at the University of Berkeley. And I was reading our discussion forum, and I noticed naturally a conversation coming up with all those words. So I salted so, some more ever words into a realistic conversation of the type that students would have in a, on an online chat board. Right? I, I guess I'll study whenever I can. And that last one, that one came from a student. Can someone please help me to register? Whatever password I try to choose is rejected. So absolutely from a real student's life. I take a lot, I got a lot of academic skills based on, on this, this poor young man. This, this is my son. Anytime he had a, a personal or academic struggle, that's why I say poor guy, his life wound up in, in one of my textbooks. I always asked his permission, so, so he knows his life has wound up there. But I used his, his academic struggles and, and some of his 21st century skills struggles to, to base texts on. Uh, this is an example from the, the highest level of, of Open Mind, book two, where I took his college application essays and I deconstructed them. So the writing point is, is punctuation and connectors, but the content is one of his essays that he used to apply to university. Because I, even if we're looking at semicolons and commas, I still want the example language to be something that's academic, that students will, will use. 
I took his other application essay and, and I broke it down into an exercise. So I've adjusted the language a little bit, right? And I'm still salting in unit vocabulary, but the organization and the content came from his real, his real essay and experience. His, the summer of his freshman year at, at university, he did an internship in Cameroon for three months. And while in Cameroon, he had some, I would call, culture shock experiences. Because, of course, Africa and the United States have, have very different cultures. Um, so I took his experiences and I put that into the life skills spread. So... This is actually two pages. If you think this is the left-hand side of the book, that's the right-hand side of the book. So there's a two-page spread on anticipating cultural differences. And this, the, the organization, ASEC, that, that is profiled in this, this first exercise is the organization that sent him to Cameroon. So that is authentic materials. And we're talking about how to prepare students for encountering a different culture. And then the, the reading, you see that thing with the mountain, there's a little blog post. So he didn't, he didn't write a blog post, but we talked about this, this um, situation. He, he and some other interns and some friends from Cameroon were going to hike Mount Cameroon. So they got in the bus, and my son with his American mindset, and I think the other interns, there was one from Germany, there was one from the Netherlands, we're thinking, okay, if we're going to start at 8 o'clock, it's now 8 o'clock, let's go. So they get to the bus at 8 o'clock, and they don't leave immediately. And then the driver is talking with some friends. And then they finally take off, and the driver drives to a gas station to buy gas. And at the gas station, he meets some more friends. And, and the Westerners are getting very, very nervous about time. <laughs> and uh, I think my son actually yelled at the bus driver or something but came to understand that in Cameroonian culture, friendship and connection is more, are more important than precise schedules, and that he had to relax and understand that. So I picked apart this incident and students work on what he learned, but also how he could have prepared himself better. If you knew about how time and schedules worked in the country you were going to, would you have an easier time. And of course, they got to the mountain, they had a nice hike, everything worked out fine. And he learned something very important about a culture that is not his own, and that it is possible that for many people, a precise schedule is not the most important thing in life. So in conclusion, what we want academic materials to do. I, I do want to say that, that a, a book can't teach your class, right? A, a teacher teaches a class. It's not the books, if a book were enough by itself, then the teacher wouldn't need to be there. You could just send everybody a PDF. That's, that's not how it works. A book is supposed to provide you good text. I mean, for me to write a unit like that fire unit can take a month, right? you as a teacher with everything else you have to do can't squeeze a month's worth of writing work into one or two nights right so the book should have done all that work for you so you have good listenings good readings but also with all the language pulled out for you and 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 carefully salted through the unit so you but you you do want to make sure that that language relates of course to the unit topic, but also to students' lives and also to the world, right? Because you're, I mean, with, with young adults, right, high school, university, young adults, we're trying to get them to understand how, what, what their place is in the world, how they belong and, and what they can contribute. English is one thing they're learning, and I know that they have exams and grades and all of that is a very real part of a student's life. But we do want them to have those 21st century skills. We want them to know how to communicate to other people from different countries who communicate differently. We want students to learn how to learn. 
We want them to learn how to, to interact. And, and that last one, I, I do want students to learn how to care and why, why academic topics are important and what they have, as I said, to, to contribute to the world. So that's me and what I have to talk with you today about. Um, that's, that's my website if you want to follow me and see what I'm doing. If there are any questions, hopefully my, my beautiful assistant, Nathan Waller, will have picked those up for me. And do we have any questions? Dorothy, hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Good, thank you so much for that. That was uh, really interesting. I was following all the way and there was a lot of uh, questions in the chat box. Um, oh, good, good, good. We'll, we'll pick up some of them. Okay. Um, but definitely really interesting um, listening to all of these different ideas. Uh, an early question that came up was, Skillful has three L's where Elements only has one. Did the Japanese actually uh, go with it in the end? Or did it yes, yes. I, I have no idea what happened to that objection when they came back and said, it's going to be Skillful. And I said, what, what? But you know what? Some, wait, wait. Sometimes, sometimes you understand, sometimes you don't. And of course, the word skillful is particularly amusing to me because it's one of those few words that British English and American English spell differently. And yeah. you know, we have a, you know, a British English publisher and then an American English book. Although at the upper levels, we also have texts from both British English and American English. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have plenty of L's, plenty of L's for everybody. Now the Japanese can learn to pronounce their L's better if they use skillful. Yes, my spell, spell check has had a, a wonderful time over the last week organizing this. Uh, yeah. This. Okay, so let's, uh, there's a lot of questions. So I'm, we, I'll pick a few and um, let's see how we do. So we have one from um, Hanan. So her question was, uh, would you please suggest some critical thinking activities after writing or reading tasks. Actually, I want to extend that question a little bit, more to get your opinion on when you think critical thinking tasks are most appropriate within a oh. unit or out a unit. Um, yes. <laughs> Actually, from, from if, if, if we're thinking just about the examples I showed you today, from the very first moment that they're looking at that infographic and thinking, Okay, but what does it mean that more forests are privately owned than, than publicly owned? That's critical thinking as they apply that to, okay, therefore whose responsibility is it? They're not done with that question. They've just seen an infographic, but they haven't done any, any, any deep work with it. But we're gonna keep coming back to that question of responsibility and management, even, even in the other strand. So I think any time I don't want students doing a lot of mechanical work, mechanical work, and suddenly think, right? They should be thinking all along, right? And even yeah. even mechanical or more mechanical exercises, I think, should be thoughtful. So if you're going to be putting a vocabulary word into a sentence, the sentence itself should be a, a thoughtful sentence, right? That you should... Our, our real estate in a textbook is so precious, right? We have this much space on a page that every every sentence on that page needs to be working hard and, and doing several several jobs at once. Yeah. But anytime students stop and question and engage and apply and extend, that, that should that should be happening throughout the unit. Right. Yeah, I, no, I agree. And uh, yeah, one of the things I really liked about uh, Skillful when I saw it for the first time was the fact that it opens with that infographic. And I know yeah. the other academic courses way back in the day, they, they didn't. And I, and I really like that, that introduction. I would agree. I think that um, the, these yeah, critical people, people the don't always throughout the whole think, unit. Yeah, you don't always think of a graphic as being a reading skill, but it is. And there are people for whom graphics are very difficult to interpret. Um, yeah. There are people who kind of skip them as if they're pictures, but they, they often have essential information. And now that more reading is done online, we have more infographics. I think even in print material, we have more infographics than, than we did 20, 30 years ago. So yeah. I think that, that's a key academic skill for, for students. And I think the, the modern students probably engaging with more infographics yes. on a daily basis 
then I mean, yep. certainly not that I would have done it at school. So, yeah, no, I do. Um, okay, yeah, so I really like the fact you talked about this, this kind of scaffolded approach throughout the units uh, and building the topic up. So using the the units, whatever the topic is that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but then relating that, I guess, to students' local con uh, culture. So you mentioned about, you know, we could talk about the flooding of the Nile, whether that's actually good or bad, rather than just flooding being bad. So th this is really nice. Um, contextualizing and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in the panel interview um, but also I think it's important for, for students if you are doing that to lead them down that that path and get them thinking about okay maybe I could change the topic from forest fires to flooding but then yeah. also that if they're not from Egypt how does that you know what are the political side effects you know there's a lot going on between Egypt and other countries further down yeah. the Nile, um, or down towards the base of the Nile um, but if right. they're not from Egypt if they're from the Gulf you know, what's the wider implications of all that? I think we yeah. can bring those kinds of things in, would you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so if you if you broaden the topic to, to natural disasters and challenge or weather or extreme conditions, every country deals with that. But I also want students to feel that they are connected to every country. I don't leave, live in Egypt, but a lot of my clothes have been made with Egyptian cotton. So Egyptian agriculture affects me, right? Yeah. So we, for, for academic English, we want to get them out of a very narrow, this is my life to realize, oh, my, my life is, is more than my home. My life is what, what happens in the world. And, you know, when something happens, when there's a, a virus in Italy or Brexit in the UK, it affects everybody, maybe positively, maybe negatively, but we all feel events around the world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. This interconnected idea. Okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to change tack a little bit because um, there's another question. It's about okay. uh, lower level students. So I know this is going to be um, an area that a lot of the audience are probably interested in because they probably do have a lot of lower level students. So they're asking about critical thinking around the A1 level. You know, can students do critical thinking when their English language skills are very low? Or should we perhaps use L1 for critical thinking tasks? What's your opinions around this? Uh, well, of course, L1 use is 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 very controversial. I have yeah. to say that I'm I'm not against it. I know some people feel very strongly that you know an English class should be English only. I, I'm not against L1 if there's a reason for it. I don't want students to come in and say good morning in in Arabic. But if you have an idea that's important and you want to express it and you can't do it yet in English, I would rather have it happen in Arabic than not happen. So I think the, the challenging thing, and, and, and we all know this if we've studied a second language, is that that point in your, in your language learning life when you can't say very much because you don't have the structures or the words, but you're not, your, your mind isn't any lower level. So you can still think critically, even if you can't express it critically. So, I mean, obviously the tasks for lower level students are, 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 are easier tasks in that the vocabulary needed is easier, but you can still rank things and, and identify fact or opinion. You can see if something's relevant to something else. There's all kinds of, of I'm ready, you'll get into some of this in the panel, of critical thinking skills that can happen with less language, right? I, I know when I, when I go visit you know, an Arabic speaking country, I don't have much Arabic, you know, and, and, and in North Africa, I, I can rely on my French, but I'm still thinking all the time. I'm still making choices and decisions and, and noticing things and applying knowledge. So the task for a, a writer of lower level materials is, is how do you structure a task so that students can still display their thinking? Yeah, still access it. And perhaps, yeah. perhaps for lower level students, rather than relying on L1, maybe they need more time, perhaps, to, mm -hmm. to give them more time to, to engage with it, you know, to come up with ideas. Um, yeah, or, or, or a careful task that asks them to do something that they can do with the language they have that still yeah. respects the quality of, of thinking that they're doing. Yeah, balancing it out. Okay, another question somebody's asked is around um, International exams, things like IELTS, do you take uh -huh. those things into account when you write the materials? Um, 
Yes and no. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm more familiar with, with TOEFL writing and, and I've, I've written TOEFL textbooks. Um, and I, but I think about IELTS as well. We're, we're somewhat aware, but I don't want to do an exam preparation course because a good exam, and I do think that both IELTS and TOEFL are good exams, are going to reflect the student's English at that level. So if they're if they're learning how to organize ideas and present them clearly and connect them with transitions and support opinions with evidence and information and facts, they're going to naturally be fine on a good international exam. I think it's it's helpful to know the structure of those exams, but you know that information is available free on their websites. So I might, if I knew that I had students who were soon going to take a TOEFL or an IELTS. We might do a little bit of, of practice, but those exams are just, you know, the gate into an English speaking university. And I don't want students who can pass an exam and then fail their classes because that doesn't help them. We, we actually had that challenge in the United States with, with, um, with Chinese students who got very, very good at taking the TOEFL. But the TOEFL doesn't test speaking like IELTS does. So they would arrive at the university with their great TOEFL scores and then they were failing their classes. And so our English Language Institute began giving our own tests, even to people with high TOEFL scores. And we would pick out those who were still weak in writing and speaking and send them to English language classes. So I want, I, I understand why students care so much about those test scores. I, I do understand that. But as a teacher, my job is also to prepare them for beyond the test. What happens if they get in? Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've been on the flip side of that coin because I've been an IELTS examiner in China. So I know exactly uh, ah. the, the approaches that they use, um, you know, the idea of memorizing as much content as possible. Mm. Um, you know, they learn two or three different topics and then they manipulate the questions according to what they, they know. All of these kinds of, of tricks. Um, within that type of, of learning. So yeah, and I guess perhaps this is where the idea of the study skills comes in. Yeah. They need additional yeah. skills than just the language when they actually go into their courses. Okay, so we um, actually, have we got time for one more question? We've just gone over. You got it for one more? Yeah, I'm fine. There's somebody actually just put uh, one right at the end of the chat box here, Asma. Do you think that lower level students should start learning general English before moving to EAP? Now I know that this is, um, uh, an area that's under discussion in places like Saudi Arabia, and I know um, that they do have think, general English courses. I think it depends how low you're you're thinking of. I'm I'm imagining the the language institute that I worked at for a while in in Yemen, but I had I, I would call it an A zero class yeah, of, sure. of, of people who were learning the alphabet. So if yeah. you're learning how to write A B C D then you know academic skills are, are, are <laughs> it's, we're, we're not ready for that yet yeah. but you know, i would say around a2 level I, and it's, it's it's not so much that i mean academic english is is still english i think it's it's more that you're going to be applying your english to different topics and you're not talking about i don't know dating or shopping or something but even even that example i gave from from the open mind, which is an A1 level unit of, of letters and numbers. It's not, it's not, you know, shopping for clothes on the weekend with your friends at the mall. It was students buying and selling things as they move in and out of apartments at university. The language is the same, the topic shopping is the same, but the focus is just slightly different. And sometimes it's the way your materials look so that students feel that they're being treated more more realistically. I don't think, I mean, certainly a general English class for low level students is not gonna hurt them, it, it, it's, right? So I I think either, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna say both, both are good. Yeah, so uh, yeah, perhaps Asma, we can um, show you the, the, the foundation level so you can see that low level of English, uh, perhaps with a, slight academic flavor so general topics but flavor yeah. yeah um okay good actually i have one question for you um because uh students don't learn english 
uh, at a regular pace. They don't move from A1 to A2 to, A2 to B1 to B2, you know, at the same pace. Mm -hmm. All the books are the same length. Is there, is there particular reasons around that? Or does that question make sense? So you have a certain number of hours for A1, certain number of hours for A2. So um, I'm referring uh, to uh, the kind of intermediate plateau, I guess. Right, does, does every unit have the same number of pages? Um, right. Some of that is just sort of for the, the student and the teacher's comfort, that there's a certain comfort in, in knowing that a unit is this long, a book is this long. Yeah. And I, I think if, if one book were, were noticeably longer or shorter than another, even if, if we felt the hours were the same, it would, it would make people nervous. <laughs> So some of that is just maybe cl classroom expectations. Um, I, I personally tend to be a very slow teacher. I would, I would rather do eight units well than 10 units quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a conversation I, I'm always having with, with program administrators <laughs> that, that, you know, how, how, how fast do you go through materials? And I, you know, no matter what book you're using, that's always a conversation teachers are, are having with administrators. But I, I mean, if I could talk to administrators, I'd be saying, slow down, slow down, and make sure the students really know something before they advance. Uh, and that's one nice thing about Skillful is that you could take, you know, two or three units of the listening speaking book and integrate it with the reading writing book if you wanted to spend more time on a certain topic or with a certain, you know, grammar point or something that you you could use the same, you know, the two strands, you could use them together if you didn't have them running in, in parallel classes. Yeah, good. So there was lots of other questions. Um, some of them were uh, more specific to Skillful itself. Um, I've made a note of them, um, and because of the interest of time, I can come back to them. I can always okay. think of the last one. Um, some of around structure and all this kind of thing. So I, I can answer those questions. Okay. But, but now, Dorothy, we will let you go uh, and have your back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, thank you. I might listen to the panel discussion. No, I, I really enjoyed it, I, and there's lots of uh, really nice comments in the in the chat box as well. So I think a lot of people also really enjoyed what they what they heard. If anybody has any further questions, we will pick some of that up as well in the panel discussion. Uh, the idea that we can take some of these questions that have been asked and we'll approach the topic of how do we personalize that, how do we contextualize that here within Mina. So we've got some guests that are going to be with us working here within Mina. So they should have some really interesting insights into more contextual challenges that, that the students that we have actually face. In the meantime, we will say goodbye to Dorothy. Dorothy, enjoy the okay. day. Goodbye, well, thank you so much we'll for, for coming and sharing your time with me. I, I, thank you very much. We're gonna take uh, a short five minute break. So we'll start again at 7.30. 15. Uh, in the meantime, I will play a short video, I think, if I can get it up. Um, and then we will introduce um, our uh, panel guests, and then we will crack right on with our panel discussion. So if you want to grab a quick cup of tea or a quick, uh, cup of coffee, take a short breather, and I will see you in five minutes. Let me get up the... Okay, 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 and we'll start again at 7.15. If I can get it up, I will.
Okay, I think all of our um, panel are here with us. If they would like to open up their um, microphones at least, if they can open up the cameras, they can, if they're not able to, because I know some people cannot. That's absolutely fine as well. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you managed to grab a cup of tea. We have Alan and Barry with us. Good evening, guys. Hello. Hi, Nathan. Hi, yes. Barry. Hi, we can hear you, which is great. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mansour and Dr. Turki are still on mute. So if they can hear me, you need to, uh, just above the attendees, you need to unmute yourself if possible. Hopefully there isn't a problem with that. Apologies about the video, I uploaded the wrong one, so we couldn't actually watch it. But we'll send it to you in the follow-up email and you can watch it then. That's the way things go. Okay, Mansour, yes, you have unmuted. Yes. Can you, you can hear us, Mansour? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, good evening, everybody. Excellent. Okay, uh, Dr. Turkey, hopefully he will join us in a second. I hope there's not an issue with there being too many presenters. If they are, we'll have to just keep moving back and forwards between muting each other. I can mute when I'm not talking, perhaps. Yep. Okay, good. Let's go to the original presentation. So, what's up? So welcome back, everybody. Um, for the next hour, we're going to have a panel discussion. So I'd like to introduce each of our panel members. Uh, we're really happy to have them all with us this evening. Uh, the first um, panel member that we have is Dr. Turki Al Salami. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Turki. He's an assistant professor of TESOL. He was awarded a BA in English Language and Literature from KAU in 2002, a long time ago and an MA in TESOL from New South Wales University in Australia in 2004, and a PhD in TESOL from Flinders University, Australia in 2013. He has served in a wide range of higher administrative and executive capacities at the ELI private, uh, prior to his appointment as Vice Dean for Graduate Studies and Academic Research in 2019, where I think he now uh, serves. He served as ELI Administrative and Financial Affairs Supervisor from 2014 to 2015, and as e-learning and distance education unit head from 2017 to 2019. So Dr. Turkey, uh, welcome to you. I think your mute, uh, your microphone is now on, so hopefully you can, you can hear me and we can hear you. Yeah. We can, Dr. Turkey. Hi, nice to see you. Yeah, likewise, thank you. Uh, we also have Dr. Mansour al Malki uh, joining us also from Saudi Arabia. He uh, works as an Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics, the Dean of Supportive Studies, and the Director of the English Language Centre at Taif University. He obtained his PhD from the University of Melbourne in Language Assessment in 2014, and an MA in TESOL from Curtin University in 2009. He's uh, CELTA qualified and Cambridge Trainer Trainer qualified, and he's taught English for several years in Saudi Arabia as well as Australia. Nice balance there. His main research interests include language assessment, teacher identity, professional development, blended approaches to language education, and qualitative research methods in applied linguistics. So I know that me and him definitely have a lot to talk about. We also have joining us uh, Barry Tadman uh, from the Macmillan Education team in the UK. He is the publisher for adult and assessment. So all of that stuff we were listening to uh, from Dorothy about. Barry is the person that put all of that together and he works very closely with the authors and also with the local teams, so a nice bridge. And finally, we have Ala Fadil from the Macmillan Education team in Egypt, who's our senior educational consultant there. And she's also done a lot of um, teaching in um, adults and uh, higher ed as well. So we have a real range of um, 
experiences, levels, all sorts of things. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion with you all, I'm sure. So for the process for the discussion, I thought we would pick up perhaps on um, and follow up with Dorothy's talk around motivation. So this idea around engaging students and some of the challenges we actually face here in MENA around actually getting students engaged. What does it take to motivate them? Why are they not motivated in the first place, perhaps? Then perhaps we can look at the importance of 21st century skills here for Arabic speaking students. And perhaps we can look at study skills as well. And then we can see how the discussion goes, what directions it takes us in. Again, if anybody has any uh, questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I will keep monitoring them um, and we will progress and see how we get on. Good to see you all this evening. I hope you're all well, wherever you are in the world. We're in different places. I'm in Dubai. We've got some guys in uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you're in Riyadh or Jeddah, either of you. And we've got Ala in Egypt. Jeddah and Barry in the UK. Uh, yes, the whole thing is being recorded, uh, Claire, so you can catch up with this again later. Okay, so um, let's get started. I've, I think I'll pitch the first question um, to the guys in Saudi around perhaps, because you have a, a lot more um, idea around the, the challenges that students in your own institutions face. What's your opinions on um, student motivation? What motivates what motivates them, um, and how can teachers build um, those engagement skills? I guess. Um, up to you. Who wants to go first? Doctor Turki, I can see you. Would you like to go first? Uh, yes, please. Well, I, th I think uh, you've uh, uh, mentioned a very important. Uh, I hope my, my voice is clear. Yeah. Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. I think the uh, issue of motivation uh, is is uh, is large at um, research and also at classroom level, and uh, uh, as we all know, motivation drives all all our behaviours, uh, whether that uh, learning uh, a language or learning anything. And um, uh, if I could uh, probably uh, speak on my own on context in Saudi Arabia, I would say that motivations have been shaped in our language learners uh, by different factors. Uh, and these factors uh, play uh, or contribute a very important uh, role and play an important role in, in creating a student's uh, motivation. Um, uh, one of these factors would be uh, the uh, previous education experience of, of the learners themselves in schools. Uh, uh, and um, and and that experience uh, is is uh, quite different from studying at university level because uh, in schools they actually study English as one of the subjects in 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 in, in a, a rich curriculums. So they have uh, uh, only maybe uh, five hours a week, um, uh, while in when they go to universities they actually have uh, eighteen hours uh, of studying full time. So that that's create let's say a big shock for the students. And um, with with coming from school uh, with just five hours uh, and uh, their motivation and learning is distributed between all these subjects. Um, and when they come to universities, now um, uh, they have to study English uh, at the pre preparatory year for, uh, for 18 or 16 or 15 hours, depending on the programs. And that is actually a, a, a bigger dose for the students. Uh, to to observe and to comprehend compared to the private uh, to previous experience in in the schools, uh, one of the other factors too is is the uh, is the teachers and and uh, that they've been exposed to in in the in the classrooms. Uh, when they go to universities, they have different teachers from different backgrounds, while in in in, uh, in public schools they mostly have Saudi evil teachers. And uh, their strategies in the university is quite different from what teachers do in the, in the, in the, in the schools. So that's also a play uh, uh, a role in, in, let's say, in the motivational techniques they use or strategies they use. Um, um, and, and also the curriculums they, they've used. Uh, now, uh, in, in the, in, well, I've seen the curriculums in the schools and they're not really quite different. From, from the universities, especially when it, if, if, you, if they've been taught general English. However, when they are exposed to academic English, this is a big challenge for them as well. 
and this is a different uh, learning experience that they've never had to uh, be exposed to. Um, and that uh, actually uh, might work the other way around, might demotivate the students. So uh, teachers uh, who teaches specifically academic English, they need to uh, create uh, more engaging uh, strategies to motivate students and ease the experience of doing an academic English course at the university level. Uh, I, I think these are just a very general uh, factor that play with the motivations. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would definitely agree with a lot of what you just said. And actually, there's a, there's a comment, a really a lovely comment in the um, in the chat box about female in, female students in Saudi now being very motivated. So perhaps, you know, uh, this work on uh, changing teachers' mindsets um, yeah. around, around motivation, whether or not, you know, they, they do say that it's, you're more likely to demotivate a student than motivate a student. You're far more likely to do so. So, you know, working with teachers, I guess, within their professional development to, to keep them um, working towards motivating students rather than uh, yeah. that can demotivate them. Uh, Dr. Masoud, do you have anything you would like to add uh, around students in Saudi Arabia? Well, uh, thank you very much, Nathan and everyone. Uh, I guess you hear me well now, right? Uh, well, I would say uh, uh, Dr. Turk Turkey has covered most of the of the uh, challenges that are faced by students in Saudi. But if you just allow me, I'd like to just uh, uh, categorize those challenges into two different categories. One is pedagogical and the other is is attitudinal and both actually heavily affect uh, uh, students uh, motivation one way or another when it comes to the pedagogical uh, challenges uh, i would say number one is using uh, sort of like um, uncontextualized uh, or unsupported teaching materials uh, that actually one way or another uh, do not keep students motivated all the time and when talking about the uncontextualized uh, teaching materials, uh, not only covering the social aspect, uh, but covering um, also the, the uh, uh, um, other factors like uh, uh, tackling uh, uh, life competencies or 21st century skills, or, or even promoting students' uh, um, uh, global citizenship aspect well, one way or another. Uh, you know, it's not anymore teaching a language uh, is not anymore about grammar and vocabulary. It's also beyond that. It goes it goes uh, and tackles issues like uh, uh, um, uh, like life competencies, critical thinking, and so on. And nowadays, you can see that uh, 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 um, different teaching materials produced by different publishers. Um, uh, they actually tackle things like global citizenship, and that's quite important nowadays. You want to make your students global citizens. How can you make that if your uh, uh, teaching materials are uh, um, uh, only one-sided uh, and covers uh, only uh, uh, like your own social aspect, and they don't go beyond that? And that's quite important in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, when, talking, when talking about the academic uh, English, I guess in Saudi the the experience is a bit different because in in most of the universities we teach uh, two streams basically. One is EMI stream, and the other is the non EMI stream. And with the EMI stream, uh, uh, talking about colleges uh, that use English as a medium of instruction. And uh, in that, in that stream, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, highly possible that students uh, master the language uh, uh, better than those uh, uh, who don't actually use English as a medium of instruction. So that could be uh, um, uh, uh, an area of, of research, I would say, uh, uh, and uh, an area of investigation, if you can, if you can call it. Uh, uh, when it comes to selecting and adopting academic English materials. Yeah. And uh, looking at the unsupported teaching materials, of course, you mentioned that, and uh, Dorothy also covered that aspect. Uh, it's quite important that uh, 
students uh, uh, will be provided with uh, some decent digital content uh, in mm -hmm. order to be fully uh, um, engaged uh, with the materials. So uh, yeah. yeah, that that's basically. And okay. uh, yeah. To Awesome. You've you, you've jumped a little bit ahead to the 21st century skills. So I want to kind of keep keep towards the motivation. I'm actually going to target uh, Barry in the for this question because the the guys there have been talking very much about uh, motivational challenges. As the publisher um, who's working with the authors very closely, how do you guys take student motivation into account when you're putting together the books and the materials? So um, we have uh, our editors. Um, me included have a background in uh, teaching uh, students from from Saudi Arabia, from the kingdom, and from the, from the region. Um, so we we try to. I think it's about the topics. Um, that's the main thing in, in a course book. Um, a course book like like Skills for Second Edition. Um, trying to make sure that the topics are within the kind of uh, knowledge area of the students, not too far outside it, um, and so that they have something to talk about. Um, we're not talking about uh, theatre plays um, in France. We're, we're talking about um, the kind of questions that they might find um, ahead of their IELTS exam, or the kind of questions that they'll need to answer for a university entrance. So, I'm trying to keep things uh, within um, the kind of knowledge area of the student um, really it does help, but not limiting them. Uh, like we said before, global citizenship is is, is um, especially around. Um, culture and the uh, new descriptors we have in the CFR for culture um, are, are, I think, really important uh, for students to get uh, a kind of, uh, oh, I can't remember the word, <laughs> to get um, a, a kind of a sense of uh, culture from other countries, not just from, from their region, but um, our course books, we have uh, course books from I have sorry topics from other areas, but not really from uh, the Middle East. So that's what we're trying to put into. Yeah, and I, must, and I can imagine it's a, it's a it's a delicate balance. I know when you're in the market, you know when you're in Saudi Arabia, for example, they want to see a lot of Saudi Arabian content. But I guess it's balancing that with a comparison with more international things as well. So. Yes, it's difficult. Okay, um, Ala, we'll come to you next. We'll stick with the topic of motivation because you've got uh, a lot of experience with students in classrooms. So there's a question around intrinsic motivation and extrinsic, motiv or extrinsic motivation within learning. Anything you want to kind of say around your experiences of working here in MENA with students and their motivation? Well, I have to echo what Dr. Turki and uh, Mansoor said earlier, uh, because one of the things that get students here in the MENA region a little bit demotivated is the fact that they are kind of thrown into this environment, academic environment that they have no experience whatsoever um, with, and they are expected to perform at a certain level. Um, so because of the lack of exposure to academic content, uh, they are kind of a little bit demotivated to delve into that area. Um, but most of the time, these students work on their academic uh, uh, English in general because they want, let's face it, they want to finish college. That's it. Uh, and they want to uh, get over with their uh, exams. So that's kind of one of the motives or the things that motivate them to actually study um, academic English. Um, but when it comes to challenges, I think there is a huge gap between general English, the general English that they study um, in school, and the English that they are later on ex exposed to in, uh, in university. Agreed. I think we lost you, Nathan. Ah, yes. Nathan, are you still there? He's in the chat box, so. Yeah, I think he has uh, connection problems. 
Yeah, it's good time to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah, you can finish Allah if you want it. It's okay. Uh, he'll come back. No, no, it's okay. So these are the things that I wanted to add because um, you've basically covered uh, most of the points related to motivation in general, but it is such a... Um, such a true challenge even for students here in Egypt um, and trying to address that gap between um, general English and academic English is a little bit challenging for, for students and for teachers at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's about it. But if I can ask you guys a question till uh, Nathan comes back. Um, yeah, go ahead. From your experience, what techniques do you guys use when you're teaching uh, EAP to different students? Because um, at university level, you will have students from different backgrounds and from, uh, um, and again, um, they have different experiences with the English language. So do you have different techniques to teaching EAP to these kind of students? Let's start with Dr. Turkey. Oh, oh my God. Um, well, actually, I think uh, uh, I, I would say just uh, not my experience, though, but I'll, I'll just speak generally speaking of what we do here in the English Language Institute and Gideon University. Well, actually, what we do, we, we, uh, we provide training to the teachers. Um, and, um, and, and that teachers, we recognize that uh, transition of, of, of from general English into academic English. And we understand the challenges that the students go through. Uh, and usually what we do uh, is we uh, uh, offer an induction day for the students where we uh, 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 tell them about this academic English and why is it important for the further studies at the university. Um, uh, at the classroom uh, room levels, uh, well, what we do is uh, we uh, actually provide professional uh, workshops uh, for teachers on how to teach academic English, where even the teacher themselves transfer from teaching general English into teaching academic English. Uh, and, and that's for them is, is also a shift. So we, we have challenges from the student side and also challenges from the teacher side. And we leave that to the teachers because we believe in the teacher creativity on the classroom. So they, they have their own techniques, they have their own way of engaging students. So we leave that room for the, for the teachers to do uh, what they do in the classroom. Yeah. Welcome back, Nathan. I'm back. Hi. Yeah, good. Um, you guys were just continuing without me, I hope. But I, I kind of uh, hijacked your role for, uh, for a little yeah. bit there. <laughs> it wasn't a ploy at all to uh, also, in the motivation side, I want to add something that somebody also mentioned in the chat rooms, which uh, reflect two things. One of them is the materials themselves. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the uh, could be one of the motivated, uh, demotivated uh, to the students are materials, uh, especially when you expose students to uh, something that they've never exposed to. So um, I think the creativity of the teachers is to link whatever they study. Uh, in the classrooms to something, uh, let's say, students are familiar with. So if, if you're talking to students about um, something in, let's say, Costa Rica, some of them, they don't know where Costa Rica actually exists or where it's located. So uh, if you, if as a teacher in the classrooms, to make students more motivated, more engaged, I think the teachers could relate to something that they are familiar with in the classrooms. And that's one of the things I would do as a teacher or I would encourage teachers to do so. I would agree. Uh, Alan, you want to... I obviously, I've, I've put my camera on uh, off just to help my connection perhaps. Um, Alan, do you wanna, I, I missed obviously our whole section before uh, Dr. Turkey's talk there, so. Yeah, I, I'll kinda let you... asked, I kinda asked the guys a question. I asked them if they're, uh, if they, 
use specific techniques for teaching EAP to different students because obviously we have students from different backgrounds inside the same classroom. So Dr. Turkey was just answering that question and I would love to hear Barry's thoughts if that's okay with you, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah. Uh, Barry, I think you're on mute. You're, you're still on mute. <laughs> Jimmy, um... I lost my mute button. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it is really important. I think half the time, because I, I taught um, students from the region for a long time, and I remember th thinking there was a big focus on critical thinking where sometimes I think actually what they meant was um, kind of knowledge about um, areas outside of the region. So I think it is important that, that there's um, uh, this kind of a balance between making sure that they can talk about something that's important to them. For example, if I had Saudi students and we had a whole unit of um, you know, the course book that we were studying on, um, on cinema, um, yeah. well, uh, you know, or let's talk about pets and, and ah, you know, again, ah, we, uh, there's nothing we can talk about there. Um, whereas if we can talk about um, something that's more uh, applicable to um, their, their jobs or their interests. So a lot of my students were law enforcement um, officers. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about something that, you, that um, is interesting to them. Um, and then we got a, a lot more communication um, and, um, and then trying to get, um, like the, the best thing was that all my students were, it was a monolingual class, so they were all Arabic speakers. So that was perfect for me. So I would get one of the best students um, from my class and say, tell me what you did at the weekend. And he would just tell me, and I'd say, okay, now say that in Arabic into my iPhone. And he would just, um, and I'd record him in Arabic, and then I would play it to my class and then say, what did that student say? And then for an hour, and the motivation was incredible. For, uh, for, the, for an hour, they would just, and they would write on the board what, what the recording said, but they would disagree. And then I would say, ah, the, but the English is wrong. So I, I could come in and say, ah, let, let's, let's, let's correct the English. And then they'd say, no, 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 but that's not exactly what he said. He, went, he said he went shopping in London, but he, uh, but he went with his friends and, and it was a perfect lesson. So it, it's that kind of intrinsic motivation that can come out of um, um, just how, how you set the class up, really. Yeah, someone in the chat box just said, talk about cars and we will be fine. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I um, did a course, book. I used to work for a university publisher um, before uh, working at Macmillan and uh, yeah, cars was a big thing. We had lots of things about Ferraris and, and, the, and uh, male students, what about the female yeah. students? I don't know oh, yeah, 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 because the, Thank you. The, the classic car market mm -hmm. exploded. So we could see, we could get all the graph language through. Yeah, through shopping, cars. someone said shopping. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, how, how much cars are worth now to how much they were before and you know so you can get all the graphs out of this yeah uh, I, uh, if you if you if you don't mind me interrupting here i think the role of the teachers in the classrooms in motivating the students using different uh, authentic interesting materials to the students that support the learning aims in the book is very important um uh, the, the problem, I think, one of the uh, well, no, sorry, one of uh, uh, some of the teachers they don't really take that concentration in the classroom. They think it's a big burden on them, uh, and they just go and teach what, whatever in the book. While actually, these books are supposed to uh, guide the students into learning, but also you can add to them something that from the local taste of the of the students. Totally agree, uh, Dr. Mansour. Would you like to add something? Well, uh, I'll be hearing to colleagues uh, t talking about your point. Thank you very much, Allah. Um, the thing is that uh, it's actually two-sided. It's a student side and teacher side. Uh, let's start with the student side. Uh, students really need to be fully engaged in the materials that they are studying in order to be fully motivated. 
uh, if if the materials are not really tackling the issues that uh, uh, matter most for them, they won't really be engaged in, in doing the exercises or activities or, or, or whatever uh, uh, tasks they might be engaged in. Uh, when it comes to the teacher's side, uh, uh, just like what Dr. Turkey has been mentioning, they really need a very well-structured uh, PD uh, uh, program in order for them to be to be uh, fully equipped with the skills needed to teach uh, academic uh, English. Now, uh, back to the point I mentioned earlier uh, regarding the uh, 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 distinction uh, between the EMI and non-EMI streams in Saudi, uh, where, where students study English for a purpose, uh, which is quite obvious, uh, using English inside the classroom uh, as a medium of instruction, while the other stream where students only study English for, for general purposes. Uh, those students who st study English for general purposes, they might not be engaged or uh, 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 like uh, uh, studying English for longer period of times. Uh, just like what Dr. Turkey has been mentioning. I mean, six hours a week won't be enough for them to master English language. While those doing the EMI, they might be having like a, a larger amount of, of uh, language instruction that will enable them uh, uh, more and more to master the, the, the language. So I think it's two-sided. Teaching materials need to be contextualized, need to tackle issues that matter for students. Uh, teachers, of course, need a uh, uh, well-structured, purposeful, supported and rewarded uh, PD programs. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Nathan. In, in Is he here? Oh, yeah, yeah. I am here, yeah. It's, uh, it keeps, it's kicked me out a couple of, couple of times. I've, I've learned the hard way, as somebody's mentioned in the chat box, that only four people can be on the, the mic at the, at the same time. So Barry's muted, so I'm allowed in, basically, and we'll have to keep watching. Okay, good. Well, I, I mean, I missed a little bit of that, but um, what I did here was uh, fantastic. Uh, so let's um, move a little bit around uh, perhaps study skills. I know that study skills has come up a lot um, more recently. Um, again, the shift from, you know, just kind of uh, teaching the kind of components of language and language skills to more holistic uh, forms, I guess, of, of academic English teaching. So um, what kinds of study skills, what kinds of, of, of sub-skills um, do you guys see as being important for the contemporary MENA students? Um, and do you think teachers uh, focus on them enough? Do you think they see them as an unnecessary kind of add-on to what we already have to do and we don't have time for that? These kinds of things. It'd be really interesting to see your opinions around, um, around this. Who would like to go first? Uh, Dr. Turkey, uh -huh. you're... If you don't mind, please. You like yeah, somebody else to go first? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you can do it. Try to say again. Can Allah hear us? I said Allah, if she wants to go first, speaking about Allah. That. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Allah, you like to unmute? I'll mute and you can come in. Yeah, sure. Thank you about that. Um, I mean, when it comes to skills in general, um, I find that one of the areas that students struggle with would be related to listening. Uh, for some reason, students are not used to listening to long lectures. Uh, and um, of course, related to that, no, t no taking. So they cannot, for example, listen to a professor giving them a lecture and at the same time take notes. Uh, so one of the things that I find really useful with uh, students studying academic English is to let them listen to uh, short podcasts. So sometimes I'd, I'd work on podcasts with other um, teachers or other students and let my students listen to these podcasts and give them like guided tasks so that they can work on their listening skills and note taking skills. Um, and this is one of the problems that we face with uh, students in Egypt specifically, um, who are not used to listening to long lectures. 
Uh, so that's one of the points that I would love to say and leave more room for you guys to say more things. Absolutely. And actually, I'll, I'll, um, I'll take what you've said and, and redirect that perhaps to, uh, to, to our Saudi guests. Because uh, what, something what you're talking about there is this development of uh, the student becoming a more independent learner. Yeah. So uh, this is obviously a challenge, and it always has been a challenge. So within your teams, within the universities that you work, how do your teams work together to, to develop student independence? Is, is there any kind of tips, tricks, uh, methodologies that your teams use? Mansoor, maybe you want to go before? Dr. Mansoor, not sure, is he muted? Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 absolutely, Nathan, activating non-curricular activities uh, and uh, activities that would uh, support students outside the classroom. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, from from experience, uh, uh, when I used to work uh, like for the uh, English Language Center at Taif University, uh, we used to have like uh, uh, activities uh, uh, that would help students uh, outside the classroom, including uh, English club activities or, or uh, dealing with uh, low achieving students and, and uh, uh, designing programs that would uh, help them during uh, uh, exam times uh, and, and so on. So I think these uh, are all uh, kind of activities that can be used in order to support students uh, during their study. Uh, uh, the most important thing, Nathan, uh, is that uh, all those uh, kind of activities need to be purposeful uh, and need to be sustained. Uh, it, it's not, it's not uh, uh, an event, it's a process. Uh, everything needs to be structured, it needs to be uh, uh, like uh, within an overall uh, uh, umbrella that would serve the same purpose. Uh, otherwise, if if those kind of activities uh, uh, are not sustained, it won't actually help much. So uh, I think it's um, it's an institutional effort where everyone needs to be uh, uh, serving the same goal uh, in order to to help students during their study. So yeah, yeah, excellent, Dr. Turkey. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, please. Yep. Um, Sorry. Hi, Dr. Uh, Masih. Yes, please. Uh, well, I think the uh, when what you say about uh, uh, learners' autonomy is is a big concept in the research, and um, uh, and it has different names, of course. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, most of uh, our institute now trying to uh, create more autonomous learners. Um, what what I would say uh, about that, in particular with academic English, students are, uh, especially at universities, doing academic English, they're already, uh, I would say, uh, extrinsically motivated because they are going to major in colleges, well, uh, what the Dr. Mansour uh, said about AMI colleges. And these AMI colleges is very competitive, and the level of proficiency in English actually uh, is considered when they calculated the GPAs into enrolling in these colleges. So uh, that alone will be linked to students being motivated and create their own strategies on seeking uh, or learning or developing their own language and their own in their own time as well, because. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, what I've seen, we would see that uh, academic track students are motivated more than general English students uh, because of that big factors. Um, one of the uh, things we do in the uh, English Language Institute at Cambridge University, uh, something that we call it a, a language advising program, which, where we support students uh, into overcoming their own challenges. And, and, and by the way, this language advising uh, uh, programs are also mentioned in the literature. 
We try to uh, work on, on uh, research-driven or research-informed uh, uh, strategies on improving the students' uh, autonomy, is, uh, overcoming their challenges. And we do recognize these challenges by the students. I mean, uh, they are in into a new program and it has uh, different challenges, as we mentioned earlier, that they are never been exposed to academic English. So this is for them, most of the students, th this is new to them. And this is also some of the teachers, this is also new to the teachers. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, one of the uh, things we do in creating learners' autonomy is we, teach them uh, what uh, uh, Dorothy mentioned, learning to learn. And that's a skill that uh, many uh, language programs try to focus on because this will increase uh, students' learnings, motivations, engagement. And in the long run, it will increase their own uh, lifelong uh, learning aims as well. I think that's it for, uh, for this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, so we're, we're kind of coming towards the end. So I want to give each person uh, just like a minute to think about the, the, the topic that we've had, challenges faced by academic English students in MENA. What would be your summarizing thoughts? Um, what, what tips would you give to um, our audience in terms of um, helping students to progress with academic English? Is there anything in particular? Uh, if you allow me to start, Nathan, uh, I would advise all teachers, and I, I'm a, I firmly believe that as a teacher, you uh, uh, go back to research. There are many teachers who published uh, uh, their own uh, experience, and let's say what they call action research, where they uh, laid down the struggles of their uh, own personal experience in the classrooms, also. Uh, that they can, they can actually use keywords of their own problem that they face in the classrooms uh, and they will find many uh, uh, publications uh, that have tackled these issues uh, which which will provide them with strategies and ideas on overcome these problems uh, i've always believed in churches uh, and teacher researchers as well uh, and i advise all my colleagues who are teaching english whether that university or schools, is to try to look back in the research because uh, these are based on, on empirical studies and evidence. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer. And I think, um, yeah, what I'm pulling out of what you're saying is this idea of doing their own action research in class yeah. and basing their decisions, basing what they do with their students on the data that, that comes out of that, whether that's qualitative or whether that's quantitative data. And, you know, an action research doesn't need to be, you know, a huge project. It doesn't need to be a PhD. It can be very small. Focus on one particular thing. Yeah. If you don't mind, Nathan, yeah. I'll just add one point to even to the publisher themselves. Yeah. If they want to offer uh, uh, workshops, also, especially if we say the, the teachers don't have the time to read research and all of that, these workshops can be actually a summary of a publication. So somebody did their homeworks and they came to you know to a workshop and they showed them what the research had said about certain area of let's say classroom management or learning autonomy, something like that. So that, that will be enlightening to the teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, hopefully, you know, as the audience engages more with uh, the, the MENA PD Academy, which I'll talk about when we finish, you know, we are connected to Spring and Nature, which is obviously a huge, um, research organization so a lot of our activities now you know are embedding that you know they're taking um, whether it's research or articles from one stop english whether it's taking stuff from spring and nature and bringing that together and making it more accessible for teachers i think when it comes to professional development and uh, access to research i think it's about accessibility making things very easy to find uh, organized taking them along a particular kind of pathway so something with you that we're working on, definitely. Okay, um, Dr. Mansour, anything, any concluding uh, statements, uh, anything around professional development? I know it's an area that you're really uh, passionate about. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, thanks for the valuable input from, from all colleagues. Uh, well, I would say uh, uh, teachers really, really need to be uh, supported in order to be successful uh, in, their, in their teaching, need to be supported by a, a, a purposeful profession development program, be it from the institution they work for 
or from the uh, uh, publishers. They produce the, the learning materials. Uh, students at the same time, uh, they need to, to see the reason why they need to study academic English. They need to see the reason why they should be more engaged and more involved. Uh, and from, from my perspective, dealing with uh, a large number of students and teachers at the same time, uh, I would say uh, uh, providing uh, um, uh, well-equipped teaching materials would help both students and teachers at the same time. Uh, by saying uh, well-equipped teaching materials, um, I'm actually literally referring to uh, the digital component. Uh, uh, that would, would help students uh, in their uh, learning and help teachers in their teaching at the same time. Uh, well, that's all from my side. And uh, just one final statement. Uh, uh, language learning is, is a process, not an event. Thank you very much. Absolutely, yes, I would agree. Um, Ala, would you like to go? You're on mute. Yeah, sure. Uh, so if there is, uh, if I can share one tip with um, teachers in higher education, that would be um, to go for explicit teaching and to never take anything for granted. Never uh, take for granted that your students know, uh, because most, most of the time they wouldn't really have a clear idea of the instructional language that you share with them. So do not take that for granted and um, depend on a lot of explicit teaching and give them a lot of models that they can analyze so that they can um, you can later on bridge this gap between general English and uh, academic uh, English. So that's one tip that I would share with teachers. Very good. Yeah, really nice. And finally, Barry, anything you'd like to add? I will mute Barry so you can come in. Okay, um, for me, it's um, the academic writing. Um, it's, it's just incredibly important, and it's the, I, in my experience, it's the the area where the students from uh, MENA struggle, um, especially um, in in exams and uh, ahead of their university studies. And so, when I was teaching, um, my students would um, just write one paragraph and it would be this and this and this and this and this and this all the way along the paragraph. So then we had to structure it into four parts and then they would repeat everything all the way down. So then the next stage of that was trying to stop them repeating but saying the same idea but with different words. Um, and then we were starting to get towards our 250 words or whatever it was for IELTS. Um, and then it, I came to the conclusion that it's vocabulary, that that's what my students didn't have. It was vocabulary and vocabulary was, was the problem with academic writing. And so that's one reason why we, we cover the entire academic word list in, in, uh, over, the, over the course of the skillful book, um, skillful course. Um, but not only are the academic words, these are the uh, non-subject specific um, incidental vocabulary, but also topic vocabulary. You've got to have the fruit and vegetables, the the, the cars, the um, you know the, the the phrases that you need for everyday English, as well as the academic words uh, that are common in essays and in lectures. And they kind of learn those together, and then you've got um, enough coverage to write your essay. You can write it without repeating, and you've got enough coverage. I mean, Paul, um, Paul Nation says you've got to have 80 or 90% of the vocabulary to properly be able to read something. So it's all vocabulary. So that was, that's the, the takeaway that I had from my 10 years teaching. Nathan, so, can I add something to what Barry said? Because this is actually a very interesting topic. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, because when, when Barry discussed academic writing, he was all for uh, vocabulary. But there is also one thing that I've noticed teaching students in Egypt. Um, there is also, um, like, culture also impacts how they, they write their academic writing. Because we have people who speak Arabic. Arabic is their first language. And academic writing in, in Arabic is completely different from academic writing in English. So if I'm writing um, in Arabic, it's it's very normal for me um, to repeat uh, my my points over and over and over and to be indirect. Uh, so sometimes students kind of like translate that into English as well. Like they they take their 
the things that they are familiar with, with academic uh, writing in Arabic, and they do that uh, in English. They also are not familiar with hedging, for example. So this is why they struggle a lot when it comes to academic writing. So I just wanted to add that in addition to, of course, uh, the, the challenges that they face with vocabulary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, mean, I, oh, sorry, go on, Barry. My students' writing was, was um, it's almost like poetry, it's very beautiful to read, um, but um, especially in an exam or in an essay, that, that, that English structure has to be there uh, because that's yes. just what's expected. Such a shame. Uh, I really like reading. If, then if I uh, can add to uh, Allah as an Arabic speaker, and I faced this when I was in Australia, uh, many students have struggled with academic writing because this skills has not, not developed in the mother, you know, the L L1. So they've actually never written something academically in Arabic. Yeah. So they have to learn another, so they have a, a language challenge and also a thinking, because academic writing is thinking. And so, um, so this is a really big challenge because you would be surprised to learn that uh, many uh, have not actually written anything academically in Arabic in schools. When they come to university, they have a struggle. Even even if we ask them to write something in Arabic, academically, they will have struggle. That's the known writing in a different language. So thank you so much, Allah, for raising this. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would I would echo what uh, Barry said as well. As I mentioned back when we were to Dorothy, I've obviously got experience in in IELTS. You know, and if and if you do look into it, if you look into IELTS scores, especially in places like Saudi Arabia, that the discrepancy between the four skills is, is actually a lot that the, the writing mark is progressively lower than, than the other skills. Um, I, I would add to that as well that based on what you guys are, are saying, that I think it's really important to have a, a variety of reading. Um, I know that um, there's a lot of research around this idea that um, you know to improve in writing is not just doing more writing, actually improving in writing is a lot more reading. So engaging students with reading, reading to them. I would say my, my tip, uh, my final thoughts tip relates to that a little bit. Uh, and it perhaps ties into where Macmillan um, as the publisher can perhaps come in. And that's, I think, building platforms between various uh, levels on a student's learning journey. So we're talking a lot about the challenges that students face in a higher education setting, but we need to think about everything that comes before that. How is uh, the foundation programs connected to secondary school programs? How are secondary school programs connected to primary school programs and, and down to pre-primary? So that they follow that pathway along, almost kind of getting to the root of motivation, skills, uh, interests, all of these things, and building them up from, a, from, a, from an early years perspective. You know, helping primary school teachers in Saudi Arabia to focus on academic English skills alongside uh, the things that they're doing within school, you know, and I think that's where the, the power of uh, of a publisher can come in because we have those connections between each of those levels, and sometimes I think they're disconnected. And I'm sure you know different institutions work with other institutions in different ways, but it's it's an area where it's it's time consuming for a university to be able to connect with a secondary school or ten secondary schools, students coming in from different levels, different backgrounds. So, you know, I think that's, you know, something that the publisher and certainly something that we're looking into, how can we build those bridges? So, and also, and also connecting institutions, you know, if uh, one university is using Skillful and another university in Jeddah is also using Skillful, how can we connect those teachers who have similar types of challenges, similar mm -hmm. types of students, so that they can support each other, you know, moving away from this idea that, um, the publisher is the expert that we can solve all of your problems. I think institutions supporting each other and, and we're working quite closely on that. That leads me to my final slide as we say goodbye. I'd like to thank all of the panel. I'm sorry I had a few uh, technical issues along the way, but I will wrap up. Obviously everything was uh, in this, uh, this symposium was designed around uh, Skillful Second Edition. If you wanna know more about Skillful Second Edition, certainly get in touch with us. We'll be sending um, a follow-up email to each of you. And I think we can provide um, access to flipping book material. So you can actually go through. And if you have any questions around the structure, these kinds of things, you're certainly more than welcome to ask us. 
We also, I've been mentioning this idea of platforms. So we've created the Professional Development Academy, which is actually the MENA Professional Development Academy. Um, and we're working alongside the, the UK's advancing learning themes. There's five that's running throughout this year and all of our professional development activities are designed around them. Inclusivity, digital skills, global skills. We've been talking about 21st century skills. And we're making uh, you know, self-study, self-access materials built around uh, the products that we have. You can link up with us at the moment on, in, on any of these uh, social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You just have to look up Mina PD Academy. But we're also developing a platform, uh, hopefully ready for September, which will have everything that teachers need in one place to be able to support them using Skillful. So um, stuff around, you know, what Dorothy was talking around, um, the design of the unit, how to maximize engagement with students, the purpose of critical thinking and 21st century skills, how to develop writing, all of these things. There's additional information there around the product. Alongside that, this idea of uh, de developing a professional development community. So linking institutions using Skillful up together and also for other products. If I do a lot of stuff with the young learners as well. Yeah. So I spelled community wrong there on the page, but it's professional development community. And this is what we're the aim is to, to bring people together. The experts are out there in the MENA market, so you guys can help each other as much as possible. We can provide the platform for that. That's all. We've come to the end. We actually have one minute to spare, which is which is great. Uh, Thank you yeah. all once again. Dr. Turkey, did you have anything you'd like to add? I Sorry. just really want to thank Macmillan for inviting me uh, for this uh, professional event. Uh, I want to thank uh, those who've commented on the chat, I've been reading your comments, they're all great ideas. And that means you're great teachers. Honestly, I've been reading excellent ideas. Thank you so much for attending, sharing and, you know, and, and posting all these great ideas that I hope that we can implement it in our classroom. I'm very happy today to be with my colleague, Dr. Mansour, who's a dear friend of mine. Uh, Ms. Ala Fadl from our beloved uh, country, Egypt. Uh, Mr. Barry uh, uh, Tadman from, from the UK. Uh, I'm very glad to be with those professionals today. Yes. And, uh, and of course, thanks to you and for my millions for inviting me, of course. No, you are most welcome. And we were so pleased to have you with us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Turkey. Ala, thank you very much. Barry, Mansour, I cannot see you in my squares, but I think you're still there. Uh, you're on mute. Did you, did you want to say anything before we well, finish? I I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much, Macmillan Education. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan, for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, uh, colleagues, Allah and Barry, and the attendees for um, being very active uh, throughout the, the time of the panel discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Yeah, I would, I would agree. There's been some amazing things in the chat box. And I will, um, I will see the chat box because it gets printed off afterwards. So I will go through that with a fine tooth comb and, and, and reply to people if I think there's something really amazing that they've put. Thank you very much. I'd like to say good night to everybody. We will end there. If anybody has any questions, my email is there as well. You are more than welcome to get in touch with me. Thanks again to our panel. And she's not with us now, but thanks very much to well, everybody as well. And I bid you all good night. Thank you very much. And we will look forward to seeing you at our next event. Inshallah. Good night, Cheers. everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.